Every Ghost in the Shell enemy rank, from Oshi to Sak 2045, anyone who arrives science fiction has to worry about the present overtaking their futuristic fantasies is particularly true for a franchise like Ghost in the Shell, which is over 30 years old. The first chapter of the manga came out in April, April 1989 and has developed drunk events like the collapse of Japan's bubble economy, the last decades and increase in deployment of Japanese self-defense troops abroad, and 17 prime ministers. Just to name a few, Andrew Ghost in the Shell has maintained its core team of Major Motoko Kosanagi, Bato, and the rest of the counterterrorism group of Section 9 trying to keep the peace. To a greater or lesser degree, all of his various per permutations have responded to world developments as well as the visions of their creators and interpreters. What follows is my complete subject rank of my various envisions of the world of Ghost in the Shell, written in vote number 1 cyberpunk anime by readers of Otaku USA. From worst to best, and it take worst with the Great of Salt. Here. Even at the least engaging, I take most versions of the Ghost in the Shell before a lot of the other stuff that's out there. Ghost in the Shell Arise When Arise came out, Ghost in the Shell has already been drunk three films, two TV arcs, and its slew of novels and games in addition to Masamone Shiro's manga. At that point, creating a new origin story for Kosanagi and her compatriots. With new voice actors stepping in these roles was definitely a risk, and unfortunately it was one that didn't quite pay off. One of the reasons I mentioned politics and the Japanese self-defense forces in the intro is that the Ghost in the Shell has always been a very political beast. Masamune Shiro's original manga deals heavily with political machinations, both geopolitical as well as an internal in Japan, where Arise generates some dramatic action scenes, having, having the core of the story be about the squabbles be, 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 between different corporations and government agencies drastically lowers the stakes since it's so hard to care which side wins at the end. It is not just the internal power struggles that trends and derail arise. I really hate the term technobubble because it's too often used by people who haven't paid close enough attention to what's going on. But well, that's probably the best term to describe Arise's take on its technological future. Another reason Arise comes and lasts is due to how it's released. It was the first Ghost in the Shell OVA series released in four increments in 2013 and 2014. The series was then recut in a television series called Alternative Architecture, changing the chronology of the events and adding additional material, which then was released in Japan as an OVA of its own. Surprisingly, given the popularity of Ghost in the Shell in general, Alternative Architecture never received a physical release in North America after the first four OVAs did, perhaps indicating a lack of enthusiasm over the series. I'm going to throw Ghost in the Shell the new movie into the list at this point as well, since it's really a continuation of the Arise series that doesn't stand alone, as it were, in my day job working in it, I'm careful to never name anything that I'm going to be keeping around for a while when the tag knew I had to work with mainframe databases already two decades old. They are still called new, just because we are information at the time just happened to be older. The chosen name for the movie final finale for the Arise Saga smacks of desperation more than anything else. As if they're trying to flee the baggage of the rest of the series but can really come out with anything better. Goes in the shell sec 2045. If Arise was a risk with its new take on familiar characters, Sack 2045, the most recent take on Ghost in the Shell, is revisiting old friends who are back to the characters of the standalone complex chronology and the voices that they've been familiar with for nearly 25 years. Unfortunately, this familiarity means that some of the differences presented in Sack 2045 are even more jarring. Yes, I have to talk about the animation. The animation, Ghost in the Shell, has always doubled the 3D CG animation for the very first film to the opening credits of the first standalone compact season. However, Sec 2045 is the first full CG Ghost in the Shell series, and unfortunately it looks shocking so far, but there, but there are any laugh out loud CG errors like in the recent Berserk series. The world thing seems too smooth and unfinished, both with regard to the characters and their environments. Camera movements sometimes seem unnatural and too languid, as if you're trying to pad out the required learning time and the editing choice are occasionally baffling. However, I can overlook a lot of this if the story and writing are good. I mentioned the problem that science fiction can have the getting overtaken by history. In the case of Sack 2045, with its references to reach 1%, and the episode titled Edgelord, the revolution of the 14 year olds, it seems like their series is trying too hard to the current, which is that where science fiction should be aiming, especially for a series unsustainably set 25 years in the future. Some of the other Ghost in the Shell series have shown how to tackle issues that are both contemporary and timeless, something to which Sack 2045 should perhaps pay a bit more attention. In spite of these reservations, and out drunk the first half of the story takes too long to really get going, but the end of episode 12 they have begun to construct a really engaging mystery. 
On Junior Recruits to see where it's some headed and wanted to see more. Something I didn't expect to find myself saying after the first couple episodes. There's still another half of the series left to go. I'm drunk, I'm not entirely convinced that it wouldn't blow it. However, I really want it to do well. And if it sticks a landing, the cool even see Suck 24 and 5 moving on a place or two if you were to receive, revisit this list, list later on. Ghost in the Shell, Standalone Complex, Solid State Society. Season through the new movie, Into the Ranking alongside the rest of the Arise. You may be wondering why Solid State Society gets its own entry since it's a film to follow the first two stand-alone complex seasons. Under SSS falls into a bit of the same trap that Arise does, getting a bit too self satisfied with its own political complexities. It does exist as its own thing rather than as, as a mere extension of the previous standalone complex escapades. One of the strengths of SSS is that it demonstrates some genuine character development after the end of the second gig series. Kosanagi has left Section 9 and has ventured out of her own, but the major to rent him, and, Bat and Bato has become something of the lone wolf, a development that we can also see in Innocence. One of the characters, Togusa, is perhaps the most interesting here, as it leads into the leader and manager of the sometimes unruly Section 9, Andrew Aramaki, is still at the top. It becomes Togusa, who holds the team together and gives them directions on a daily basis. Even if we're watching it, after all this time, I still get a little emotional during a hallway scene with Togosa and his daughter. It's a good film that can make you care about a character in this way. I just wish other aspects of Drop Triple S held together as well. It's not that it's a bad film, but it doesn't have much of the substance to say, which is a bit of letdown following the phenomenal second season of Standalone Complex. Ghost in the Shell Standalone Complex First Season But the first season of Standalone Complex came out in 2002. We have only seen a tiny bit of Ghost in the Shell in animated form. It happened in Mamoru Oshii's 1995 film. Of course, there's also an animated introduction in Interstitials, but the PS1 Ghost in the Shell game in 1997, it is still the animation that comes closer to replicating the look and feels of Masamune Shiro's manga. There was so much more in the Ghost in the Shell world yet to be explored. Standalone Complex provided the great point of entry to the revisioning of a near future world that was a bit brighter and perhaps by optimistic than Oshii's film had been. Directed Kenji, Kenji Kamiyama had been working in the anime industry for over a decade when he got the chance to helm Sack, his first major work as a director. However, Kamiyama proved himself more than up to the challenge, giving the series a lighter flavor that could appeal to a wider audience than the previous feature film. Still, Kamiyama remained in depth. The Oshis approaching the Ghost in the Shell TV series inherited many aspects from director Oshi and didn't try to distinguish myself from director Oshi instead. I totally tried to cop him. Rather than focus on one aspect of the Ghost in the Shell world, Standalone Complex drew a little bit of everything into the mix. A little bit of thriller, a bit of philosophy, some literary allusions, of course geopolitics, and even a taste of futuristic romance. For everything that Sak was trying to do, and given Kamiyama's relative directorial experience at the time, the series shows come together as well as it does. I really wish they had given Kosanagi some plans in the series. John, she must be cold. Ghost in the Shell, the tagless show on one of the movie posters for Ghost in the Shell, Read People Love Machines in 2029 AD. Personally, I'm excited. I just set a few more years away. I'm sure that must have sounded pretty futuristic back in 1995. Drunk, I have a feeling that we will see a world like we see in the film in another 9 years. But of course, anything could happen. The original Ghost in the Shell, maybe single, the single film I've seen the most often. It's one of those I'm always keen to watch because I'll find himself picking up some detail and a miss before in it. Mamoru Oshii transforms Masamune Shiro's cyberpunk prom into a far more somber affair that trims away the fat for a reflection on the nature of the self. When I put like that, it seems amazing that the film has been as popular as it was. For decades, the fact that Ghost in the Shell's top and Billboard sales chart in the US has been a selling point born in the US and Japan, a still sees the fact repeated in Japanese and occasion to this day. However, the success of Ghost in the Shell wasn't a historical fluke. Even if a director and other members and other creative staff didn't have an international audience and made and mind when they were working on it, the producers certainly had their eyes on market outside Japan. In 2008, a revamped version called Ghost in the Shell 2.0 was released. This new version took the original and altered certain scenes to render them with 3 CG animation, which unfortunately doesn't mesh well with many of the surrounding scenes. It also reworked the entire color palette of the film, giving it an amber hue rather than the green of the original. I think there were two main reasons for this. The color change tied the film aesthetically, closer to some of the Ushi subsequent works like Avalon, while simultaneously distancing it from the Matrix, which is taking a lot of the film's aesthetics and even duplicated a few scenes. Ghost in the Shell 2 Innocence 
Outdrawn Innocence appears here in the pen penultimate position. It's probably my favorite piece in Ghost in the Shell media. Like the 1995 film, it adapts some of the events of Masamori Shira's original manga, but it puts a completely different spin on things. Rather than a futuristic police procedural, it becomes an investigation into longing and what it means to be human. The plot of the film is depict Section 9 trying to solve a mysteries of murders, but the film is really about the lonely man searching for the only person who ever meant anything to him, and how the relationships can transcend species and technology. It's deep, man. At least, that's my take on things. It can also empathize with those who have no patience with director Oshi's various philosophical renderings and literary allusions. I can completely understand those who would want to throw the word pretentious at this film. Also, I strongly disagree. It's not just pretending to have a great significance. It does actually have the depth of meaning it thinks it does. It's not trying to be accessible and that's why I love about it. I could go on and on using innocence as a jumping up point to engage with all matter of philosophy Sophical speculation to plant the depths of knowledge and view weave new tapestries of thought. See, this film gets me all work up. Andre, I think every film should stand on its own and not acquire the knowledge of what might have happened in other media. I also have to recommend the novel After the Long Goodbye with Masaki Yamada as a way of gaining every further insight of the battle's character leading up to the event of innocence. Andre, there are other Ghost in the Shell novels, including a couple of late 90s, ones by Akinora Endo, and they never made it into English in the trio of standalone complex by scriptwriter Junichi Fujisaku that did. It does one of definitely the best, even if it didn't necessarily occur for innocence. Ghost in the Shell standalone complex second gig. The second Ghost in the Shell TV season is a perfect submission of everything that can go right with the series, unlike the first season. Film director Oshi was a part of this arc, created with the providing story concept. All drawn, all of the other instances of standalone complex can be hit or miss. Second gate is consistently powerful, drawn out with nary a misstep. Innocence may be my favorite, but second gig does such a masterful job. A balancing action, political intrigue, and techno philosophy in a watchable way that can have to put it at the top of my list. One of the critics who sucked 2045 is to try to include contemporary reference that made the series actually seem somewhat outdated in the future setting. Second Geek is a great example of how they engage with currency issues while still remaining timeless in a way. As with solid state society dealing with the issue of the engaging population, Second Geek deal with another issue putting pressure on Japanese civil and political systems. That immigration, in a way, more than the main other issues. This strikes at the heart of both Japan and anime itself, is Hiroki Asuma put it, the very affection for Japanese image. It's not considered a necessary condition of being an otaku, but what makes something Japanese? Anime is a fantastic visual and thinking drunk this very question. If we're imagining about how to deal with a crisis of immigration and refugees that will unfortunately probably become even more commonplace due to the instability fostered by the global warming. If you find Second Geek Church such plot topics to be interesting, I highly suggest that you check out the third season of Psychopaths, a great cyberpunk series that shares a lot of common commonalities with Ghost in the Shell, Evergen doesn't get nearly the amount of attention. There's an impulse to say something like no matter what you pick, Ghost in the Shell is great and you can go wrong, but that's not entirely the case. All Drunk, Sack 2045 is the most recent series. If you're familiar with the near future cyberpunk world, I can rec recommend starting there. Try something like the 1995 film or the first season of Ghost Standalone Complex and work your way up from there.